Uh, we forward to a next speaker, a last speaker for this webinar, uh, Professor Felix Wong from uh, Hong Kong. He will talk about how introduction of Hong Kong Haiku Center, and also he will uh, give uh, some surgery video for the Haiku. Okay, from Felix Wong, he's a conjoint professor conjoint professor of the University of New, New South Wales, chairman of CIMIGO and foundation chairman of China, Australia, Asia Pacific Forum of Minimal Invasive Surgery. <laughs> professor Ferrick Wong is renowned uh, of, for his contribution to medical education in Asia Pacific countries. He made up to 10 overseas every year to Asia Pacific countries and offered teaching in the areas of gynecology oncology endoscopy, women health, and hospital administration. He also received awards from Endos Award in Medical Science and Technology China, Ho Chi Minh City Beach Award, the People Committee of Ho Chi Minh City, Medical Ambassador, Gynecal Endoscopy Group of Chinese Medical Association, Endoscopy Award, Chinese Government Evaluation Committee of Endoscopy, <laughs> and Guangdong Friendship Award, Administration for Foreign Export Affair of Guangdong Province, China. Okay, the, uh, Professor Felix Wong, it's time it's yours to talk about Haifu in Hong Kong. Pro, Pro Felix? Yeah, and uh, coming. Sorry, trying to set up my slide and um, Okay, everyone see the slide? <clears throat> um, thank you, Chairman, for your introduction and thank you for everyone to stay behind so late. And uh, so, uh, quick. And Hong Kong Haifu Center. I'm going to share my experience in how to set up my center in Hong Kong. First of all, when, where, and how it start, all this happened. And it was an unusual opportunity and chances that in 2017, I met up with the founder of this um, high foam machine um, in China during one of the conferences in China. I visited his Chongqing high foam medical technology company limited. And I was impressed with the development he had with the high food treatment as well as the way he provides teaching uh, in the center and as well as the treatment of his patient. I visited the center and found that there's a well-established high technology company with great potential for our gynecologists. And this will be the present large uh, factory and center. Now, in order to provide the high food operation service, <laughs> I have planned the design of the Haifu Center, learning the technology, establish the center, and promote the Haifu. And the centers are visited in many places in China. Also, I visited uh, South Korea as well as Taiwan and um, to see various other places how they set up the high food center. You can see different high food center room on the side. Now, I find that the issue identified is doctor and patient communication in this one is too far away. And if teaching may affect the patient privacy in the other one, this one is too dark. You may not be able to see each other. And this is too crowded. And this one, the space is too large, and as well as this one, just like an operating theater. 
So I identify some of the problems that I'm going to set up my center, what it will like. And our friends, of course, together, we all try to learn this technology, including a few you may know, Professor Zhang Nian. And so I have no confidence until I visit Korea and a TV in television interview. And I visit Korea and I find that Korean had a lot of stage surgery clinic with high food treatment. Because in Hong Kong, I probably want to set up a day surgery center, not in the hospital, but in a private sector. Now, that's how I begin. And the location will be in one of the old building, prest uh, prestigious building for the medical. Uh, inside is an old building built in 1958. Foundation Stone, 1957. So it is in the um, center of Hong Kong Island. Now have to see the uh, select the high full machine. And finally, I choose the JC200 because that will be suitable for my small room I'm going to use. And the JC is a bigger machine, even though they can do cancer surgery, other surgery will be suitable for hospital. And, but for a private clinic, that's what I choose, JC. What are the problem or what were the problem? How I set up the machine? I need to consider the building, the site of the building, the space, the weight bearing of the floor of an old building, the water pressure, the ceiling height, and the lift. You will see my problem is that it's a very busy district where my uh, center is, crowded with people. I got only a room of 60 meters square. So I use half of it for the theater, the other half for other facility. For example, waiting room, uh, consultation room, the learning room, change room, recovery room, preparation bed, and the theater. And why? Because Hong Kong, the rental is very expensive. Even this small room will cost me 15,000 US per month. Besides, this, there's no bigger room for me. This 62 years old building, we worry about the full weight. So we need a steel plate to share the weight of this machine. Water pressure, you can see the water pressure is so high. We have some filter early on got broken because of the pressure, you can see we have to wash. And the machine, you see the floor, it's really just able to build the machine. So you can also, if your uh, floor height is really too low, you can use the new machine JC200D. Now the lift, a small lift from an old building, we need to break the machine down into very small pieces and to carry it out and then we build it. Finally, we got everything ready and for the decoration. There's now the pictures or video on my center. You can see it's not like any traditional operating theater. It's very uh, friendly. So all my patients love it. So I use this space for the theater. We need essential features, for example, medical consultation room for the patient, sign consent. I allow doctor to learn from here instead of crowded together in my theater. It need to be a change room, the recovery room, and also space for storage, oxygen, washing, cleaning, and medicine storage. All this need to be in your mind. Now, that is what the center look like, change room, reception room, and there's the consultation room, preparation corner, the learning observation room. I mean, doctor can stay here to see what we are going on. It's the one-way mirror so that you can see inside, the patient can see uh, there are people there. And also uh, this inside the theater. I learned one thing is the light seems to affect the mood of the patient. So I use some LED light from New Zealand 
they can have a different color, just like color OK. So the patient won't feel that they are in a theater, like in the traditional theater. You can see different color will make them more relaxed. Now you can see I turn on two color. The patient went, went in to the surgery, they may thought they are in a color OK. And for people who are watching from the observation room, they can see us operating as well as they can see all the actual pictures when we are doing it. We can have communication. The learner can learn and we have all the pictures. So, but we keep the patient privacy intact. Now, I also have a facility. You can see this is a 360 degree camera. So this camera allow us to be able to see the whole picture. But when I put a camera behind here, and uh, you can see not only the uh, operating, you can see them, but people when they are bored, they can look around to see the nurse, to see what's operating. Because I learned from laparoscopic surgery, we all look at the television monitor. We are quite boring. So a 360 degree, camera will help us or help other people when they are watching, can see elsewhere. Now, another features I have is to be able to monitor the patient uh, temperature at the bottom. So when we are doing the abrasion, there's some, we are recording the temperature all the time, instantly. So I find that there's certain very interesting features. When you burn a fibroid and burn an adenomyosis, the temperature that radiate to the butter are quite different. So in, the, in those days, my nurse is uh, recording and while the patient is having the treatment. Now, what I find that now I put it in front of me so that I can watch. And this is what a uh, patient who have operation done for adenomyosis. I found that the heat spread in many directions, but for a fibroid, more on the right side, and you can see the, the temperature can rise higher and higher. I noticed that once it lasts for quite some time, the patient starting to complaining of leg pain or back pain. I need to know, I need to move or stop. So very interesting uh, infrared monitoring, just like when we are checking our temperature, um, everyone. So of course, my center have the various things other than the lighting, the wall, and uh, we have monitor, we have security, we have the alarm and communication system. So this is the center where we have all this facility, just like facility with the traditional theater. Then we start to get doctor to China to learn from Chongqing. And when thing is ready, and we starting to check the machine, get everything start. Now, my center, how to promote it? I talk to various people and um, in lectures, our colleagues in ONG, and we see a television interview and visitor from overseas. We have uh, distinguished VIP and uh, expert from China visiting my center, as well as patient, the relative are joining them during the treatment. So I allow patient relative to join them, the mother, the husband, or even the friend, they sit next to them. So. It's not only the patient admires of this uh, treatment, the relative is going out and speak to all these other people. The most important are the patient. Once they receive the treatment, they agree for us sometime to tell them the expression, uh, their, their impression, the experience, how the problem being solved. This is the number of patients we have treated. And when we first started, Hong Kong have some crisis, there's political crisis. However, despite the COVID-19, while the hospital are short of patients, our day surgery center 
the number is increasing. However, lately, we might be too successful. The insurance company is starting to cause us some problem. You can see our number are dropping. But still, we maintain at around 20 a uh, one month. For one and a half years, we managed to treat 200 patients now. So that was in March 2001. We will soon have 300 patients in a month's time or two. So I thank all my doctor for the support. I'm going to support this initiative and development. We went to Chongqing several times and visit other centers in China. So I have to learn this technology. I foresee the change of gynae surgery from what we have done, the advanced laparoscopic surgery to robotic, to some extent, some surgery will be focused ultrasound surgery. My center have been uh, I've written to tell people about this uh, surgery uh, theater design in a private clinic is published in the uh, Journal of Gynecology and Minimal Invasive uh, Therapy. So when the COVID-19 is under control, anyone welcome to come to visit us in, the, in Hong Kong to see our, my center, you're welcome. You can also contact me with all this website and WhatsApp. I'm ready to answer some question about my center. Thanks for listening. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Felix Wongs, for your nice presentation. And we open for discussion, uh, five until 10 minutes. Uh, from audience, is there any question? Okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Prof. Felix, uh, may I have a question for you? Uh, are you still going? Are you still have uh, any uh, laparoscopy surgery after you doing a uh, haifu? Yes, uh, quite a bit. Now, what happened is all the patient and um, come to you want to have the fibroid treatment, and uh, of course those suitable for haifu, we do haifu. Those unsuitable or they have other problem, and they always think, oh, but the old ovarian tumor can also be treated with high food. So patients do come for all sorts of reasons. So our patient number did increase, many of my colleagues as well, so that we can uh, offer them uh, treatment laparoscopic, open surgery, vaginal, all the surgery in, in addition to our high food surgery. Okay. So not every uh, fibroid or, uh, or, or, or adenomyosis is, will be a uh, pro uh, solved problem with the uh, HIFU, isn't it? Yeah, because um, adenomyosis, I mean, China, they can treat adenomyosis and find it very useful. We found that very useful as well. And however, um, because we rely on the insurance company to pay out, so the insurance company, one of the things they're saying that is experimental. They do not consider the, um, the China data. So because many Western country don't have this surgery done for high food surgery for adenomyosis. So we have to explain and try to help the patient. Um, it's getting difficult, but uh, we'll try. Now I've seen a few question is how many cases I'm going to do a day is that we do maximum three a day, usually two. Now, the reason is we have only a small space. We don't have time for the patient to rest. Usually after the treatment, they rest for two hours or three hours, and then they can go home. We don't have any hospital bed because we are not linked up with the hospital. So they go home after two hours. We have only one recovery bed, so that's the problem. But if the high food center is in the hospital, I think we can, like in China, we, if we got the patient, we can do around five, because some of the fibroid, we can treat it with half an hour and or one hour, one and a half hour. It's not difficult at all. Okay. Uh, is there any? Uh, is there any from audience? Uh... Uh, question, raise hand. 
Maybe Dr. Colin Wu, any, any question? I have one question here, very interesting. Is that do you have um, any medical issues such as medical radiation leak and any leak when you have high flu in your private clinic? Now, high flu stands for high intensity focused ultrasound. Ultrasound do not have radiation leak. Besides this, in fact, we treat more patients who have medical issues that prevent them or put them high risk for laparoscopic surgery or open surgery. For example, deep vein thrombosis. For example, a patient who have a cerebral uh, hemorrhage just uh, years ago, and any surgery will be difficult or will have risk, especially some with deep vein thrombosis who are anticoagulant. In fact, we are treating patients with some medical problem, which open surgery will not be able to do. Okay, now if there's no further question, uh, one question is the number of staff and the qualification. Um, my staff all, we went to Chongqing to learn from them and then we just by practice and under uh, Chongqing guidance uh, by remote control and or there's doctor can come to uh, supervise us and to see how we are doing. So many of our doctors get benefit from Chongqing sending staff to us to help us to develop the center. The qualification will be in due course, uh, APEG and individual country, we are going to try to set up the training uh, for everyone. So hopefully we'll be able to help. Okay. Uh Doctor, from, from participant is Dr. Colin Wu. Do you have any question to Prof. Felix? If not, I move to my other lecture now. Okay, I yeah. think you can go um, uh, Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, Felix, very nice job do quite a good job here. And uh, in a very short term, you get the 200 cases already. It's not so easy. And do you have uh, any uh, medical legal issue in the, uh, that is uh, in the early stage, but it's quite easy to have uh, some uh, complications or something. Did you in the early 200 cases, did you have uh, any problem in the, complication with a patient or something? Uh, very good question. And early on, despite um, I select the patient, I make sure all the patients are able to have the high food without much complication problem. Um, I myself did have a patient who have um, some mucosal fiber, not a big one, but seven centimeter. After high food treatment, she had continuous bleeding and could be due to infection or what. But when he, she went to see another doctor, she was convinced to have a hysterectomy done right away. So that's the problem that if the patient, when we first started, I'm not so convinced about the treatment. And whenever there's problem, they go to another doctor and other doctor won't know what's going on that could be one of the issue. Now, in fact, we are now treating patient, even the fiber is up to 12, 14 centimeter. So in fact, it's not difficult at all. The larger the fiber, maybe the easier. We need to know what type of fiber it is. So in fact, uh, we are lucky. This, besides this, for medical legal problem, I know many of the uh, medical legal people, especially the lawyer world. So they're helping us to set up our criteria. Okay. Yeah. Now, Let's so um, yeah. if there's no question, I'll start the, uh, because it's getting late and I'm sorry that I rushed to the other lecture. Okay, there's the video presentation. Now, first of all, I must say, because due to the time zone difference, I can't have a live surgery I hope we can, in the future, can apply surgery just like when we are doing a laparoscopic surgery. But before I begin, 
I may introduce some of the, explain some of the operating um, system because there are people who are very experienced and other people may just started to learn HIFU or may not have seen a HIFU uh, system before. So I would like to just spend a little bit of time to present with some operating system and what we are looking at. And also, I must say I did speed up the video so that to save time. And for those who are very experienced in high food, please um, excuse me because I'm not as experienced as you are, but just give me a good comment about this case. Okay. Now I starting to start off showing people this the operating concept, the interface we are using. And this is right side you are controlling the transducer. This the right, the transducer will move to the right. This left, move to the left. This foot, the patient foot direction, H means the head direction. I hope people can see, but uh, may be difficult by shoe. A means the transducer go to the abdomen side. P means the back of the patient. And this the P, Z, and uh, P, Z plus. Now, this is the trend, uh, uh, ultrasound, diagnostic ultrasound in the center where you control whether you can see clearly. Well, this is to going to divide the fiber or the uterus into many layers so that you can ablate or burn the layer, one layer by uh, another layer. Now, the treatment is like that. You can see the patient lie on the machine. There's the uterus and the transducer is going to send the focus ultrasound onto the lesion you are going to see. So you burn one by one, point by point, and then when you don't think enough at the posterior, uh, anterior, you burn the anterior as well. Usually you burn more at the back because once you burn the one anterior, it may prevent more ultrasound to go to the back. So this one of the principles we should use. We should burn the caudal side, the foot side, and then to the head. Because in this way, uh, the patient will have less pain because the sacrum is here and the uh, lower spine is here. Sometimes the radiation heat can heat, uh, can burn the, um, not burn, but causing pain on the patient. Now, so this is actually how it operates. Uh, during the world time, you can see the ultrasound, we are moving the posterior, the transducer up. We can see the uterus over here. Now we are going to find the fibroid and there's in the middle. Now usually the ultrasound is not, this ultrasound is not as good as what we are using in our clinic. We are using our ultrasound with very high resolution, but this one, after a while, you can see where's the fibroid. Now we are dividing the fiber into many layers. So each layer is around five millimeter. Depends on the size of the fibroid or adenomyosis, you can divide it into smaller layer. So usually we set at five millimeter each layer. We burn the middle layer where you have the largest area to burn and save. And then after you burn one layer, you move on to the either the right or the left and burn another layer and burn another layer until you finish. Now that's important. Later on when you see my video, you know what exactly I'm doing. What we are doing is not just one uh, plane, but because it's three dimensional. So by moving the, uh, the uh, uh, transducer, you burn one layer after the other layer, either right or left. Now, however, the so-called focus ultrasound, they have a fixed focal length. Therefore, for some patient, some very obese patient, we need to make sure that the focal length can uh, burn the uh, lesion we want to burn, especially those posterior large fiber. But some of patients are very thin. The anterior fiber, you might need to put a water bag so that you elevate the patient so that your focus point from the transducer will be able to focus at the fiber. 
the way, the nurse, to learn how to use the water pad is very important because it saves you a lot of problem. Now, how do we know you have ablate the fibroid or the lesion adenomyosis we want to ablate? Now, it's the uh, thermal necrosis of the tissue and will change the uh, ultrasound reflection. So this is what we call grayscale change. And the more severe necrosis, you may have the white patches. I call it white patches. There's many names for it. And uh, you can see that is, we have burned this. So later on in the video, when you see this, you know that I've already burned the fibro. Uh, now, how do we know other than this white patches? Sometimes it doesn't appear because we can only see some grayscale change. We use micro bubble to be able to visualize how much, uh, when the, whether there's any still perfusion within the fibroid. Micro bubble is very small bubble compared to normal bubble we have seen, it's 5,000 times less than the normal bubble. So it's phospholipid uh, with gas inside. They travel along the capillary so that any fibroid with blood vessel capillary inside, it will be shown up by the micro bubble. Just at this one, you can see this is a fibroid, big fibroid with uh, endometrium here. And you can see the micro bubble injected. And because the gas can serve as the ultrasound contrast. So that's why we can see the fibroid. Uh, over here, we are turning from one side, the middle, to one side and then go back to the other side, trying to assess how large the fibroid is. So you can see all this micro bubble in the picture. Now, and then after we have done our surgery, the high flu surgery, we then also inject micro bubble. And at the end of the operation, you can see here, there's no more micro bubble. Micro bubble, usually the sounding you can see and you know, endometrium, they're still intact. I can see the micro bubble still there, but in the center, you won't see any micro bubble. So you turn from the center to one end and then back to the other end, trying to assess how big the area you have a blade. And of course, center may use MRI after the surgery the next day, but MRI in Hong Kong are expensive. So we are using this method. One of the most important issue is the focus bone we need to focus the area we burn, but make sure this acoustic pathway is without any bowel. And it's important the bowel has gas. The gas, any gas, have the ultrasound wave, and then they will heat up. And the more prolonged it is, they may burn the bowel. So we make sure it is outside this triangle. So we are burning here, could be 90 degree. Anything over here can still be 40, 50, we don't know. So we don't want the bowel to be in between. So we always try to some way, either distend the bladder, this the Foley catheter, push the bowel away, or put a water bag over here to push it away. You will later on see what I'm doing in the video. Now, so the patient I'm going to present today is a 47 years old lady with menorrhagia and severe anemia. She have a submucosal fibroid of around uh, four to five centimeter. She requests high flow abrasion after learning the high flow abrasion. And the MRI show is a uh, submucous fibroid as shown in the video uh, later. Now, the preoperative blood tests are done and localization tests. That means uh, testing whether the fibroid can be visualized, the patient has any problem, this uh, test done before the actual operating procedures. We don't want to a patient who cannot have this surgery uh, occupying the, the theater time so that we have done everyone a uh, localization test to test is fairly feasible to burn. Uh, to ablate the fibroid. So the high flow abrasion was carried on on the, the last day of uh, last month to record it for this section. Now you can see this is MRI 
showing the submucosal fibro. And we usually see a field image, T2W, and this is a hyper, a hypo intense fibro over here. <clears throat> so after we assess the size, assess other things, whether there's any other fibro, and we're starting to do the procedures. Now, that's how we prepare the high full abrasion. There's, within the theater, you can see, while we doctors are discussing about the case, how we go about it, and uh, you'll notice that there's a large television here. <clears throat> I allow the patient sometimes to look at it and also explain to them what I'm doing, rather than we are doing it ourselves. You can see my setup here is uh, my infrared monitoring. It's over here. Now, <clears throat> what the nurse is going to set up, we put a frame over her buttock so that we can put the infrared camera around here. So now you can see what the nurse are preparing. Now, so put a frame there, my infrared camera just over here. So we cover it so that the patient will not be look like Mick. And uh, because we need to let the button to elevate the heat, it is go through the button. Otherwise, the patient may complain of pain, or we cannot cover them with any coating. So when the patient is ready, we are ready, then we can start to do surgery. At first, I would like to uh, do something like with a shroom, hopefully with this type of uh, platform, to be able to share my operation with other people. And however, I find that is difficult. Now, this is the setup of the high food when we first started using a shroom. Now, what to start with, we increase the water level so that they can cover the patient lower abdomen. Because in this way, it will cool down the temperature that may be there. Now, you see in the shroom, when we take the video, it's not clear enough. So later on, I will show you uh, more clear pictures from some of the recording I have from Chongqing. And however, <clears throat> you can still see what I am doing. I'm going to explain it. And we are moving because uh, it's not going to be so clear. I'm using a father's suite. Now, we try to localize the, the fibro, uh, the uterus, and also to see the fibro like here. Now, I will explain to you what we are doing. And then in this way, we show, show the, um, the Doppler to outline the fibro. Because the fibro usually a pseudo capsule. You can see the Doppler surrounding it. So you know that it's the fibro you are plating, just like in here. So you can transfer the image by pressing this button. They will trans uh, transfer to here. You can take a picture, just like previously. I got a frame here. Now, now I'm doing a micro bubble. Now the micro bubble in this one, you can see there's micro bubble in the uterus. Sorry that you may not see clearly. Also, I speed it up. You can see the fibroid and I'm recording it. And um, so after I see the micro bubble, I can identify the fibroid is here. Um, this is the one, the uh, focus point. I need to lower it to here. But when I lower it to the um, fibroid, I find that the gas going my way. So I need to put a balloon bed, a water bath over here so that to elevate the patient abdomen so that I can see, have this focus point onto the uh, fibroid. And then I need to divide the fibroid into various layer. That's how the so-called planning is doing. So this, uh, I identify where is the fibroid, for example, from uh, how many centimeters to how many centimeters. So I divided the fibroid into many layers. I started from the middle layer when I'm going to ablate. So I set the, temp uh, the voltage to 400 volt, and then set it to hit it one second, relax for three seconds, and in this way, uh, five repeat, that means burn five times. 
you can see the number of seconds you have vibrated the tissue. Now, in fact, by pressing this button, it will turn red. Now, whenever the water content is too low and there's various alarm to help you, you can see already there's white patches appear. Now, in order to see clearly, I show you um, the video I got from. This is the video I got from Chung Ching, a better recorded video. Now, again, I show you the later parts of the video. Now, so this is where the um, the bladder is here. And the fry boy is over here. Now, so I'm changing, uh, starting at the center of the fry boy after the mic, uh, the micro bubble, and I set the voltage to 400. You can see I press here, it turned red, so it is ablating. So it ablates one second and rest for three seconds. So that's the amount of total um, second I burn. So it's also recorded over here. And how many seconds I burn? And you can see up to 10 seconds, there's already white patches appearing. And there's sometime without patches, you can see the grayscale change. When you first started, I must say that it's difficult to visualize the changes. Only when there's white patches, you're starting to say, hey, we are doing it. But now you're able to see the fry boy. You can see I have moved from four to the other level, five level. Now, this uh, a technique I learned from Dr. Jung. It seems that um, if I'm going to ablate the one whole area together, I need to move the machine and that might have the bow in between. So instead of moving to the front, I burn each of the layer at the posterior caudal bit first. Now I move from the fourth now to the layer six. So when I see the ablation, it's more or less enough, I move to another layer. There's another layer, I'm moving. So when you move the other layer, there's not, not much um, white patches. And the more you ablate, the more you're able to see. Now this is the one after ablation, but there's already too close to the edges of the fibroid. We are told we probably uh, don't go to the edges of the fibroid because this one, remember, is some submucosal fibroid. We don't want it to burn too much into the endometrium. So we are moving from four to another layer on the um, right side. This is the right side at the level five. So all at the posterior. and. So at the caudal end, we want the heat to spread to the south or uh, to the abdomen direction and or and to the front. You can see weakly the, the fibroid. Now I move to another layer at the side. So after burning, you can see uh, it's quite obvious and the fibroid starting to have all this um, white patches or grayscale change. This is if they are not uh, white patches, sometimes you can see grayscale change, and you can see this the fibroid. Now, but I admit that this one, I am putting it a bit too low. I need to burn the fibroid is larger than this, so I need to move on. So what I did is try to identify the location, the size of the fibroid by the uh, micro, uh, by the Doppler. So that's what I have just done. But you can see um, more or less the, the fibroid I can see is other than the posterior, it's not enough. So that is the whole fibroid. And I use opera to identify it as well to help me. And, and then the front, it still needs some ablation and the, uh, the top a bit. So I try to relocate the water bed in this way to push the Bow away, so you can see the water bed is more moved to the caudal end. So I moved the uh, pointer, the focus, to more 
in, uh, to the cold rain so that I burn deeper. In this way, I managed to ablate the whole fibroid. I would say could be 100%. But when you see, when we have already white patches in front, it's more difficult to see the changes at the back. But still, you are delivering some energy over there. So it still burns the fibroid. Later on, by micro bubble, you can see the appearance of the non perfusion volume. So I'm already moving, um, trying to burn. It seems that it doesn't move. And so a middle first and move to the side. So, and this is again further on. I just give a few heat at the middle of the fibroid. Because every time we put the water bed, sometimes the uterus can be moved a little bit. So that's one of the problems. Uh, sometimes we need to be able to see what we are ablating and how large is the fibroid. And now, when we think we are more or less um, finished, then what we are going to do is to uh, inject micro bubble inside again. So that's going to wait until one thing is we you, you can see the fibroid and being burned just over here. Now there's the micro bubble. Now one thing is we are using oxytocin. You can see there's no perfusion in the fibroid. So I'm turning it from one side to another. When I measure the size, it corresponds to the size of the micro uh, the size of the uh, submucous fibroids in the MRI. So I usually compare here and the appearance and so before and after. So and I use again the Doppler to see to outline whether this is the real fiber I'm treating. So that's how I finished um, this case of a five centimeter fiber. So um, I managed to complete the procedures in 30 minutes for this mucus fiber. And the patient recovered well one hour in the clinic. She was discharged home with uh, analgesic, just some painkiller. She remained well and come back to follow up in one week's time. And her fibroids already show shrinking in size from 4.5 times 4 centimeter in the MRI in this uh, pictures to 3.1 to 3 centimeter by ultrasound. So the, um, she did not have any side effect or complaint. She will be visited again in one month and in six months time. And we believe that this size of the fibroid, if it's effective, it's probably disappear within a year. So hopefully her menorrhagia and all that will be recover, uh, will be under control after one or two um, breathing. Now, that's the whole for the uh, presentation. And I choose a case, not a difficult one, unlike our laparoscopic surgery, we usually show the, the skill we have for difficult one, but it has a time limitation and otherwise it can be very boring. There's quite a lot of technique we learn, need to learn. So especially for multiple fibroids or adenomyosis. So this is just a simple case for me to present. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Alex. Maybe any one question from audience? Okay, uh, one question for you, Prof. Felix. Is there any contraindication yeah. for the high food? Uh, yes. In some big fiber, especially MRI, the um, T2 weight, T2 weight um, image, if it's high per intense, that means they're quite vascular. Then it's very difficult to ablate. It may take too long a time. And um, this is, we usually make sure that oxytocin can control. Now, 
Now, okay. of course, the other major indication is that any suspicious of is now malasarcoma or any any lesion with possible malignant change. We need to be very careful. Now, some position of the fibroid are not easy to ablate, and uh, some may be easy for laparoscopic surgery. For example, a pectinculated fibroid. Okay, so uh, otherwise it will be yes, we can ablate it. It take a long time to become uh, regress. The lump is still there. So now, in fact, we can ablate nearly up to ninety percent patient will come to us. So the rest depends on the uh, level of the skill. So I myself set up the fibroid into various level of skill, just like our laparoscopic surgery, so that hopefully our doctor will learn the skill from one level to another. But unfortunately, it's not that easy. Uh, we use just one section. One question is, uh, how many sections are used for a large fibroid? The machine from uh, Chongqing is very effective. If you do well, we just use one section. We don't have to use the other section, even for 12 or to 14 centimeter fibroid. And of course, why people asking this question, especially the insurance company, because there are some other um, hyperthermal machine. They are not as effective as the machine we are using from Chongqing. That's why they may need several sections to avoid the um, uh, skin burn and other uh, the not effectiveness, then they need to use several sections to do it. Um, now, one question I can see is the high flow in degenerative fibroid or degenerating fibroid. Yes, we have many fibroids. They are large. They also have area of degeneration. But degeneration may have a problem when you hit at it, but we are using the uh, MRI to guide us as well and we can know where the degeneration, but it still can be done. And the degenerative area already is not going to grow. So it doesn't really affect your result too much, but it may take a long time for it to regress. Okay, so uh, yes, we can do it. And so the causes, uh, provide any cause for high flow? Yes, a page and uh, Many of the, our center, we are trying to set up some training program uh, together with Chongqing Haifu and some center in um, China. It's going to hopefully provide training course for people who learn Haifu how to do it. And in fact, the um, the International Society of Minimal Invasive and Virtual uh, Virtual Surgery um, Society do have quite a lot of teaching on the web people can go to the web to see the many of the teaching from uh, this society website. So, okay, any other question I may see? Yeah, I think more or less um, the question I've answered. Any other question? I think it's oh, already- What question is, what kind of, one kind of question, what kind of complication or high food procedures often occur for beginner. Now, for beginner, you know your limitation, just like laparoscopic surgery. I think high food surgery should be trained, not just by observing more, but to do it under supervision, under good supervision. So in this way, we'll minimize the complication. Besides this, I mean, there are uh, fibroids that can be, or adenomyosis that are difficult to do, and for example, posterior fibroid, large fibroid, anything more than eight centimeter, multiple fibroid. And so we should have various level of skill to learn and uh, various level of fibroid. But unfortunately, uh, we may not be able to divide so closely our different type of fibroid. Okay, and I think that's all. I'm getting too late now, I believe. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Felix Wong for your nice presentation. and discussion and I think it's we really has already the end of the webinar today is very interesting talk about Haifu and also uh, and then uh, give to time to Dr. Selva to close the, the webinar. Please Dr. Selva. Thank you Dr. Reilly. Um, 
So thank you for attending this webinar. Um, we, our next webinar on uh, APH and the International Society of uh, Minimally Invasive and Virtual Surgery HIFU webinar will be uh, held on the 26th of August, 2021. And you can see the uh, pro program there. There will be talk by Professor uh, Chi Rui Zeng from Taiwan on uh, challenges of myoma, uterine, and adenomyosis in fertility management. And uh, Professor Felix Wong will be speaking on why HIFU is the option for treating uterine uh, myoma. So please join us. Uh, to attend this uh, webinar again uh, in uh, August 28. The more you listen to it, the more you will understand how uh, HIFU will be one of the armamentarium of uh, 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 methods that we can use to deal with uh, uterine fibroids and vitreomyces. And, 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 what, and what has been said is that it, we cannot use HIFU for all our patients, for all the treatment, but in some patients, uh, it is a very useful modality of treatment. So with that, uh, I conclude this uh, webinar. Okay, thank you very much and uh, see you again in August. Bye for now.